Oh my gosh, what's this? A Saturday and I'm live and I'm not even alone and I'm plugging the future greatest board game Kickstarter of all time. Oh my God, it's my pal <laughs> Cena. <laughs> my pal Cena. You yeah, you promised ahead. you wouldn't do this. You oh. promised you wouldn't do this. There, you, there's no stopping me. It is absolutely the train that is barreling onward. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to me asking my pal Cena over here to come on live so we can plug Cena's Kickstarter for the expansion for his award-winning board game, The Imposter Kings. Now, dear stranger Cena, please give a little <laughs> intro to us. Who are you? <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Cena. Uh, you may remember me uh, a couple years ago. Uh, I came on the stream uh, at mm -hmm. the behest of Mr. Nine himself. Uh, again, super appreciative to be here. Um, he called me up again to come back on, and uh, I don't know why, but uh, I would love to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cena. I like games. Uh, at one point in my lifetime, I said, uh, you know, I, I have lots of opinions about games. Uh, maybe I should put my money where my mouth is, try to actually create one myself. Something no one's done in the one. history of Reddit. Yeah, like... <laughs> and so I did create one, and I got to see all the intricacies of production, finance, marketing, etc. cetera, mm -hmm. um, how it can be difficult for some people um, to strike a balance between all those different things, um, and was able to kickstart uh, The Imposter Kings, which is a card game that I have a lot of passion for. Um, lots of passion for it. Everything that I'm raising uh, for this Kickstarter, everything that I've been making in terms of money in this game, which is, yeah. by the way, uh, you don't make very much money if you try to try to you know make games. Uh, it goes right back. <laughs> goes right back into the game itself uh, because I think the game is fun um, oh, yeah. and it's something that is is something that's interesting for myself. So, um, so yeah, that's just me in a nutshell. Yeah, and I mean, let me just say, the Imposter Kings, the base game itself, is insanely fun. I love the game. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what is the base game of Imposter Kings. We're going to talk a little bit about what the Kickstarter and the expansion is about. Because in short, this is a Kickstarter for the expansion for the game. But also gives you the chance to play the base game as well. Uh, but I figured, dude, let's, just, let's actually just start by what the heck is the Imposter Kings. We go to the website and go to theimposterkings.com. And look at this. Look at this incredible quote. From a, from a professional game streamer and game developer, Day9 himself. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, the first stream we did, uh, I needed a quote for the website. And uh, and that <laughs> Day9 immediately jumped on that and said, you know what, I'm going to give you a, a quote live on stream. So we there played it is. a couple rounds and there it is. So I, I want to just kind of begin with like the dead basics. Yes, this is a Kickstarter for the expansion to the game, but like, we need to know what the base game is. What's the Imposter Kings? For someone who's like never heard of the game, maybe who hasn't even played Love Letter or some of the other inspirations for it, how does the game work? Yeah, so essentially you and your opponent get, uh, there's a shared deck of cards that you and your opponent get cards from. And each of these cards have an ability, have powers, etc. Your goal is to be the last one on the throne, which is you just playing cards. You have to play something that's equal or higher than your opponent's cards and uh if you're the last one on the throne then you you win essentially yeah. um obviously there's a lot more nuance than that there is uh there is uh, abilities on these cards that you may or may not use um so it's all about trying to fill, figure out your own hand trying to figure out your opponent's hand and play those cards correctly so you end up on the throne yeah like in in, in a simple sense i mean it's kind of funny i'm like cena how does the game work like i know how the game works <laughs> this is for you beautiful darlings at home the cards have numbers. You're alternating trying to play a card that has a higher number one at a time. But the cards have a whole bunch of different abilities that can maybe, oh, you played an eight. Well, I can play a card that can reset it back to a low number. And then we start building back up again. So, of course, if there's times where you can't play a card because, hey, there's an eight out and all you have is a seven and ignoring any other rules text, ah, you got me. That's how you win a single round. And when I say a round, a round takes like, I don't know, say four, five, six minutes to play a single round. You, yeah. you shuffle all the cards out, you deal them, you play the round, some amount of points are awarded at the end based upon who won, shuffle up again, play again, try to get to seven. Um, and I'm just sort of curious about like, in terms of developing the game, what was like some of the inspiration for trying to set the structure of the game up this way? Sure, yeah. So I really wanted to have a game that was uh, 
minimizes luck. Um, so you kind of know every single card that could be in play except for one. Um, so it right. means that you're 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 not like just playing. But if you go perfect information, then it's just chess, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's an element of surprise where you are actually hiding specific cards. And so when every time you sit down and play a game with your friends, it's a different game because each player has different tendencies. Do they try to go for the assassin play, which is one where it tries to kill you? Um, by having you run out of cards fast? Or do you go for more of a standard play where you're trying to just out, uh, outlast them by playing higher value cards? So that's kind of the philosophy was one of the things was trying to minimize luck um, and then give lots of player agency on on choosing a strategy to go based on your opponent. Yeah, I, I like the chess comparison because in some ways it kind of feels like if you started out in chess and just randomly, one of the pieces was removed. So now each player starts with just one knight instead of two. Still the same game, but you kind of have to do a little bit of adaptation. And then, of course, the fact that it's a card game, you don't literally know what the missing piece is. Just creates a lot of fun bluffing and uh, also hilarious mm -hmm. errors. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly switch the screen over to here and over to here because, dude, you might not be surprised to know that everyone in our friend group as a collective is trying to get Cena more copies sold because we think this game rules. Wait, who who did the voice for this for this video? This is how to play the Imposter Kings, the YouTube video edition. Yeah, he uh, he goes by uh, Mima uh, Shane. He uh, oh he, yes, he does the voiceover for this uh, this trailer, which kind of briefly talks about what happened, and he put a lot of work into it, and I appreciate it quite a lot. Um, so, so so we're we're gonna look at this. We're gonna look at the how to play. Right, this is gonna be a much more visceral Shane directed <laughs> communication of the gameplay. And then we're going to actually play the base game of the Imposter Kings. So that way we can play, and then when we return back to the Kickstarter, you roughly know how the game works. So, I'm so ready, are you ready? Let's hit it. All right. Hello, and welcome to the world of the Imposter Kings. A game of sub <laughs> Let's go, Shane. Shane sounds exactly like that in real life, just so you know. If we go to in and out he's like, a double-double with grilled onions will suffice. <laughs> <laughs> well, a fusion so intrigue where you must outwit your rivals to claim the Nasetti throne. The Imposter Kings is a kind of social deduction card game. Each turn, information is revealed about your opponent's strategy. Using that knowledge while hiding your own plan is the secret to victory. Here's how it works. Grab a friend, get comfy, and shuffle the deck. <laughs> then, deal each player their hand in one king card. The player who draws the true king determines who goes first. <laughs> this is so well done. Players then take turns playing cards to the throne. Cards have a value between one and nine. Higher value cards are easier to play, but smaller cards have a way of making themselves useful. To play a card, it must be an equal or greater value than the card on the throne. If you can't play a card to the throne, Try using a special ability. Special <laughs> abilities can range from ignoring the value of a card on the throne, to stopping a card's ability, or drawing extra cards. Something you'll need as in the Imposter Kings, if you can't play a card, you lose the game. But there is hope. Once per game, you may flip your king as a last resort. Flipping your king will disgrace the card on the throne and draw your successor into your hand, buying you an extra turn. However, cards like the Assassin lay in wait for the King's Flip and will end his line of succession on the spot, winning the round and some precious points. <laughs> Get to seven points and you win the match. So there you have it, the Imposter Kings, a battle of the minds that is quick to play but difficult to master. Order your copy today. Oh my god, Shane owns! Dude, that's so good! Hold on, let me move this uh, screen back over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, for those of you who are saying in the chat, yes, the, the art of the game absolutely rules. Wait, who who did the art of the game? Yeah, so uh, it's someone named uh, Mike Hirshon, Michael Hirshon. You can find his artwork at michaelhirshon.net. He is a fantastic artist, uh, uh, designer, uh, just wonderful human all around. I can't say uh, much, like, you know, more, po I, I can't figure out the words to say how cool he is, but he's amazing. Dude. Um he also uh, uh, is, um, yeah. I, I, th I again, Michael Hirshon. Uh, he's he did a lot mm. of Dota two artwork. You can actually see he just put out a new post on on Dota two subreddit. Oh, awesome. That's actually how I found him. I uh, a message him. I said, hey, 
your Dota 2 artwork is amazing. Uh, it's called Mike Draws Dota. Um, and uh, we chatted, and he was interested in this project. So a lot of thanks to Mike. Dude, yeah. No, I, and I mean, like, literally the, the community that is rallied around Imposter Kings is, like, it's almost higher value than the game itself. It's so good. Because, like, okay, so if you if you uh, are interested in checking the game out, you can go to imposterkings.com. There's a play thing here. And there's multiple ways to play for free if you want to check it out. So, for instance, you can purchase the game. You can also print and play where you download a PDF and you won't have, you know, like, the high-quality, really nice cards that come with the purchase of the base game. You can play in Tabletop Simulator, and we're actually going to be able to play in this online client where if I just click, you can just go here. The Discord is uh, where the community rallies, and you can meet people and set up a match and actually play the game. We're going to do this in a, in a moment, but I kind of wanted to ask, since you dropped the game, like there's tournaments that get run, there's a meta that's evolved, like just... I want to know more about the history of this because uh, the game came out three years ago, if that's right. Yeah, about three, four years ago. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, after it was kickstarted, um, part of the Kickstarter, um, one of the stretch goals was, or I, I believe I mentioned it in the Kickstarter, it was going to be available to play for free because we were a huge proponent of, we want people to play the game. Yeah. Um, the artwork is amazing. Uh, highly recommend people buy it because the artwork is really amazing in person. Um, but I was going to say that uh, over like you know the last four years, people have been playing this game on tabletop simulator and tournaments. Um, the playstyles have really evolved. And as I was, I think I was telling you right before this, it's really like become a cycle. Uh, it started off with people yeah. saying, "Hey, this card is not very good," and then it kind of dropped out of all the tournaments. And then all of a sudden, one of your community members, uh, known as Goose, he comes in. He says, "I'm going to make this card work," and then he makes it work, and then it's the prevailing strategy. And then it like cycles through it yeah. over and over again. So over the last four years, it's still changing quite a lot, which is amazing, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of funny that like, you know, when I when I first played Imposter Kings, I was like, oh, I get it. Okay, I it, this is a pretty simple, clear game. And this is probably the optimal strategy. And then I'd start to win and then I'd start to lose. And I'd be like, oh, no, that wasn't the optimal strategy. This is the optimal strategy. And then, like, a hundred times later, I'm like, okay, now this is not the optimal, right? Like, it's it's remarkably deep for how few pieces there are in the game. And so, like, what I'm going to do right now is kind of showcase going through playing the game. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to hit two-player standard. And Cena and I are going to play against, is it Goose we're going to be playing against? Uh, no, we're going to be playing against Ad Astra, who is uh, my friend Will. Uh, he is ready yeah. to go. Um, I right. just checked with him all right let me hit shondo i'm gonna join okay and you copy the url you basically go here hit copy you paste it over to the person that we're gonna play against i just pasted this over to cena and cena's gonna link this on straight in and then i i just kind of wait here for the game to load up now one of the things about this i mean i still can't believe that all of this is free you don't actually have to like sit down and quickly play within 10 minutes you can do something where i take a turn leave for the day you take a turn, the next day I come back, the game is just, it's just waiting. It's just hanging out, waiting for me to make the next uh, move. And let me move my uh, little face out of the way so we can see all the cards. It just hangs not, so you can play asynchronously if you want. And not to call out Goose, uh, but he does, like he was telling me that he basically has like five games running with different people. And then at work, he's like... <laughs> <laughs> when he has a free yeah. second, he's just going ahead and playing his games and then going, you yeah. know. So you can you can do it like, you know, uh, asynchronous like that, as you're mentioning. But as you notice, you're in the game now. Yeah. So I'm going to walk through some of the just basic elements that we're seeing here. Uh, should we go first, by the way? Or should we go second? Uh, well, let's look at your hand. Um, you've got a good mix. We call this a barbell hand where you have uh, some high value cards, some low value cards. High value cards are easy to play. Low value cards have special abilities yeah i think that you should let him go first all right cool now this is where i want everyone at home to know that we are not going to be relying on my strategic insight in this game at all i'm just the host okay i'm just <laughs> the guy who explains what we're seeing and cena is going to be fully responsible for all moves including any misplay i make so let me just say Very that the good. opponent goes first and what i want to kind of describe right now is just literally what it is that we're seeing. So there is this deck of Imposter King cards. 
they're all shuffled up and my opponent is dealt a bunch, I'm dealt a bunch, and then one card is revealed face up. No one is playing this card. This is just showing that this is something that neither person can have. Here's another card that's randomly discarded. This is the one hidden card that we're just not going to see in this round. So we don't really know what this one is. And so right away, you can see that if these are the cards that I have, and there's one deck of cards that we're shuffling up and dealing, I can actually just click here, and here's the cards that I have not seen. Here's the Fool, that's a one. We haven't seen the Assassin, which is a way to just immediately lose the game, so we have to be worried about this. Here's this spread of cards, and of course, each card, if you click on, you can just see what the abilities are. Immune to the King's Hand, which is another card. You may play this card on any royalty. Oh, look at this. The queen, who is a nine, is royalty. So I could, for instance, play the elder on top of the queen to reset the pile from a nine to a three. Um, now, given that this is the web interface and we're getting ready to start to play the game, uh, let me make one more rule question and then I just have a how does this interface work question. Sure. So what's going to happen is, because um, my opponent's going first, they're going to play the first card. We're going to be alternating plays such that we want the highest card to be the last card we play, such that our opponent cannot play a card. If they can't play a card, we win the round. So correct. literally, how do we start using this interface to play the game? <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, great, great question. So if you notice uh, cards that are highlighted, uh, that means you have an action that you can use with them. Mm -hmm. When you play the game, uh, you, get a, you get your hand, and yep. then you have to discard one card. So that's, card, that's one card you just get rid of. And then you have to successor one card. Now, successoring is where you hide one of your cards from your opponent right until here. you flip your king. So he has already placed his discard. He's already placed his successor. There are a lot of cards in this game that say, hey, do you have this in your hand? And they can say yes or no. Successoring is a way for you to hide that card until yeah. later, essentially. Yeah, so basically, so, the tools that the opponent will have will be these cards. And later on, they can use this one. But here's something they don't want. And I kind of want you to just walk me through what you would do and how you'd think about this so people can kind of understand the rough strategy of how they might play. Sure, yeah. So we're letting him go first because he might have some valuable cards. Um, but the idea here is that now you can wait um, to play your higher value cards. You can, you're giving him initiative, but you'll have one more card at the end of the round. Yeah. When he plays a card, um, he's likely going to try to guess. He has a card in his hand. That, uh, if he guesses correctly, he can force you to play a card out of your hand. And so yeah. what we're going to be doing is trying to hide some of those cards. You have two elders in your hand right now. Those are those two threes. Yep. These cards are very good to play against royalty, which are the nines. And you already yeah. have one of the nines in your hand. There's two nines. Yep. And so I would say you would discard one of those elders because you don't have use for one of those elders, right? right? So that's a really easy decision, I think. You click the elder, yeah. you hit discard. Um, so and that's, me, that's one thing. Let me briefly thing. interrupt. One yeah. of the things that I think is so great about the art in the game is that here's an elder. And if you click on the other elder, they actually have slightly different art. There's slightly different <laughs> flavor text that's at the bottom that just gives a little bit of extra spice, but they're consistent enough that you're not going to get confused. So basically, you know, if any of you have ever played games like Magic the Gathering, oh, I have a spell that kills creatures. I think my opponent doesn't have any creatures, so I'm going to discard that since it doesn't seem like it'll be useful. Ignoring any of the specifics of the strategy, hey, you can play this on royalty. I don't think we'll need that many instances of this, so I'm going to go ahead and discard this one. And yep. now it's time to choose a successor. Oh, I see Correct. there's, it, it's actually being covered up by your face in my OBS, but in the bottom left, it actually says the instructions of what's happening. Okay, great. Correct, uh, yeah. Okay. So on the, if you're ever confused about what's going on, bottom left says what's happening. Yeah, watch this. Um, see, see, oh, there you go. Whoa, wow, look at that. Cena, look out. Oh, okay, back to the corner with I'm you. I'm flying. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so um, who should be our successor? Because this was definitely my weakest and remains my weakest play, period. Yeah, so this one's a really interesting, there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. And this is where I was saying it really depends on your opponent. This is your first game with Will. Um, yeah. And so you don't know what kind of player he is. Yeah. But you can bet that he's probably going to try to grab something out of your hand. One of the things he's going to try to do is probably if you don't have the assassin in your hand, it's in his hand. Yeah. Which means that uh, there's a couple of different ways to counter the assassin. One of those is that king's hand card, which is that eight. 
that's like your counter spell. Yeah. This prevents him from killing you. Um, and so he's going to try to grab that card out of your hand. You could hide it, but then you can't use it as a counter spell when you flip your king. Um, so that's risky. Um, you could hide your queen, which is one of your other high value cards. Yeah. And you could hide your, your, which is a nine, or you could hide your seven. Like all of these are good options for you to hide as yeah. your um as your successor and if you notice by the way when you discarded your card you could see what it is it's uh it's yeah. that, that elder it's got that like weird highlighty thing yeah um they can't see that so yeah um just want to clarify that so and so what i'm going to do maybe... is i'm going to just set the queen away and explain like a logic that you might have which is hey my highest value card i'm going to tuck away so that way maybe later i can use it in case of an Correct. emergency so yeah, now i think yeah go that's ahead good yeah no, I think that's great. That's a great idea. So you hide the, the queen. Oh, thank and God. And if he tries to guess for the queen and misses, then uh, misses with that queen, then you're going to be in good hands. We don't know what he's going to play. He is going to play that. So um, on the bottom left, it tells you uh, what he's guessing. Yeah. So, so, so uh, you may say a card name. Other players with that card in their hand must play one to their antechamber. So yes. played Inquisitor and said the king's hand. You called it. Okay. So um, you now have a choice. You can choose to counterspell that, which basically means he has to start from scratch, or you could just play the king's hand. So what happens is when he put, when you put a card into your antechamber, that means you must play it on your next turn no matter what. Yeah. So he's basically calling you out with Inquisitor, sticking his finger right in your face and saying, you have a king's hand. And I think in this case, you say no reaction. And what happens is now you play the uh, king's hand. So now yeah. you're, it's your turn. You have to play the king's hand. Yeah. The reason why this is good is because now he has to play on an eight or higher. So yeah. he was able to get it out of your hand, but now it's you know somewhat uh, pressing in his face. We so, still have one more countermeasure for this assassin that we're talking about. Um, so let's see what he decides to do. All right, so. I see. Okay. Now, all right. Now let me just back up because there, yeah. were, there were some things that happened here very quickly that would be easier to see in a physical setting. So you'll notice that there was the four card, it did a thing, and then my eight was down. Our opponent has to play a eight or better, period. And that's just the most basic thing. Our opponent actually played soldier, say a card name. If, if any opponents have that card in their hand, this card gets plus two value while on the throne and you may disgrace up to three cards in the court. So in this situation, talk to me a little bit about what disgracing means first, because I will just note for all the viewers at home, the whole point of the game is play higher cards one after the other. Oh, but there's ways to reset that. So this is going to be kind of one of the ways that this factors in. Sure. So there are cards that allow you to disgrace, especially higher cards. They, they, uh, you can choose their um, card value, really high number, or you can flip it and disgrace it to use its power. When you disgrace a card, it essentially is removed from the game and has a value of one. So now that he has disgraced the card, which is, means that it's flipped over, you can play any of your cards that you want because he has now uh, done something that has uh, uh, um, essentially he used the power in order to to, to uh, yeah. reset the pile. And yet, we're not going to go too into depth about a lot of the strategy stuff here. Basically, this soldier did a thing to flip my big card over. And so now the top card is a one. So now I can play any card that's one or higher. And correct. this is where, um, let's see, guess uh, a card in an opponent's hand. If correct, you may play a card to your antechamber with a base value of two or more. So correct. this is where I kind of want to know if our opponent has the assassin. Like, this is what I'm always worried about. So I'm actually just going to do this. Because I just kind of want to show what happens. Let's play with an ability. And so here is all the cards that I can name. Again, I want to point out, there's just not that many cards in the game. Once you get what all the cards are, it's all about the interplay and interaction of them. So I'm going to go ahead and say, do you have the assassin? Bang. Good Reaction. Idea. Reaction. And as you mentioned before, uh, up at the top there, there's that question mark you can hit and you can see um, you can see all the cards in their hand, right? And so assassin is a good guess because it says unseen cards assassin. Yeah. There it is. And it looks like you hit. So that means that he does have the assassin in his hand. Now you have an optional ability, which is, would you like to put something in your antechamber? And what that means, yeah. no matter what, next turn, you are going to be able to play that card. Yeah. Now, as a quick question, interface-wise, where do I see that I hit? 
uh, on the bottom left, so on that console area, that's yeah. where you see everything. So yeah. it shows that you guessed um, as the judge. If you want to just move my head up, yeah, there, there I'm go. just going to be floating in the middle now. Uh, it says uh, uh, Shindo played uh, Shindo. Sean Sean Shindo I'm played Sean. Judge and said card no. <laughs> Hello, Sean. Um, uh, it said card name Assassin, right? Yeah. Um, and now it is saying pick a card to move to the antechamber underneath that, which is telling you you ah. are now able to do that or skip. If so correct, says, if I correct. may do this. I see. So correct. the fact that I see yes. this action means that there, there's correct. an Assassin in the hand. So the correct. Assassin, for those who don't know, the Assassin says, if another player flips their king, you may reveal this card from the hand to prevent their king's power and cause them to lose this round instead. Like, we're taking our sweet time playing one of these bouts where someone wins or loses again is like four five six minutes and we'll actually see that in play in a moment so um all right so uh just tell me what to do here cena this is where <laughs> i'm not sure what the right play is well uh astute imposter kings players will notice that he's kind of got you in a real big bind here so uh yeah. i think you can you could try to fight this one out um by playing your mystic as your next card so that's your seven and you can use that Mystic's power, uh, which yeah. allows you to disgrace it to say a card number, and you can say two, and it prevents that card from being able to be played. So let's try that one, I think. You move that to your antechamber, and that means no matter what, next turn, you'll be nice. playing that card. The only issue is, is that he picked up that counter spell that you had played. Um, and so yeah. I, have a, I have a sneaking suspicion what the strategy is going to be on the other side. Yeah. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, and you know, like uh, for those of you who have played maybe other card games, um what... he's flipping his king um and this is like a faded out which says you're pretending that you might have the assassin so this is like a you're pa they're pausing the game for you so that way you don't give away the fact that you don't have the assassin to your opponent yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and so you know it, it for those of you who played other card games like uh, i'm just going to compare it to magic or hearthstone there's kind of this feel of like you've made a deck and over the course of a game you're battling with these cards to try to win I almost feel like Imposter Kings kind of feels like a quick back and forth that you might have in like a fighting game <laughs> where it's just like, play this, play this, counter, do this move, do that. Oh, you got me. Shuffle up, redeal. Okay, again, play, play, play. Hmm, here's the big moment. I do this. I was right. Yeah, I won the round. Okay, let's play again. So it's like a really rapid fire, interesting combination of cards. How does this one play out? And, you know, I think like you've described... I, I am effectively hosed. I don't think there's anything else I can do. I have to play this to the ante, or I have to play this because that's what I set up right. before. And then you you want to use its ability to cancel out all twos, meaning the yeah. you know the assassin. So yeah, so he's going to use the king's hand there to stop that from being able to be played. That was a card yeah. he picked up from you. Um, uh, remember earlier in the game, you said, well, actually, earlier in the stream, you actually said, every mistakes I may make is uh, Cena's fault. This is one of my faults. I said, when he called out the king's oh, hand with the Inquisitor, oh. if you go back to there, yeah. you'll realize that if you use the king's hand to stop his Inquisitor, the king's hand would have been gone from the game, meaning that he wouldn't have been able to pick it up and use it against you. So that nice. was my misplay. Um, it's, it's one way for you to like, kind of like, oh, I could have maybe won this hand if I'd played it differently. Yeah. At this point, it's a little too far down the line. I've made the mistake. Um, and so you just play you yeah. play your high card and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, so let's go ahead and play with no ability, and we're going to see this one play out. And again, we're about to start talking about the expansion um, and, you know, kind of navigating through. All right, so here's a six and here's a seven. I can't, you've play, got a flip now. I can't play anything because this is a three and this is a three. So I might look and say, okay, this is a Muta King's hand. If the king is flipped, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this doesn't let me play. Elder is a three. It can be played on royalty. Oh, damn. This seven is not royalty. So I guess I have to flip the king. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, flip the king, which again allows that hidden card, my queen, to go into my hand. And my opponent, who we know has the assassin, assassinates me. No! And this kind of quick round shows i think a lot of these sort of interesting fun elements about the game it's not just oh here's the cards in my hand i'm gonna rattle them out and it's actually not even just here's the cards in my hand let me respond to what you're playing and use probability on my side plus some abilities the cards that are down here can also occasionally be flipped picked up rearranged they start being resources that you're playing with 
And keep in mind, this card here, this Oathbound, this was the one card that was just the final draw that no one got to see. So in every single round, there is one card that no one see, uh, that no one can see. And I feel like I feel like this is really the spice in the game that just makes each round because it's seventeen of the eighteen cards that are in play, and it always leaves that extra layer of doubt and consideration. Can I just say something about that hidden card you're just talking about? Yeah. Um, the so we play this game in tournaments. There's one recently that just happened a month ago called the Royal Rumble. Um, oh and yeah. Your, <laughs> and a lot of and a lot of your um, your audience actually participated in that. Um, mm -hmm. Goose Coco, um, all of them are actually uh, fantastic community members. Um, there were plenty of times where that hidden card, where we're watching as the observers, it is the most hype because if the assassin is that hidden card, it's really low probability that that happens. Us, the commentators, can see that that's the case. Oh, Both so players are sweating. Both players are sweating trying to figure out how to get the assassin out of the hand. One person will try to like inquisit it out, say, hey, you know what, do you have the yeah. assassin in your hand? The other player says no. And then that player thinks, wait, are you just bluffing me right now? Yeah, are you just pretending like you don't have it? It's so good. Yeah, because I mean, I feel like the assassin was the first card that really began to crystallize a thing I need to worry about. The assassin is one of the easiest ways to just up and win the game. Oh, hey, it looks like I want to flip my king to get my hidden card back in my hand. Oh, you assassinated me. Oh, gosh. And, like, so many things just blossom from this one card. And, again, in the in the collection of 18 cards, there is one assassin. So spicy. So sweet. Yeah. And so, already, there is multiple years of depth in this game, as evidenced by the fact that there has been a community regularly playing for years. And I see some of you in chat. Hi, gamers. Hello. Howdy. <laughs> and so, with this expansion, which is, of course, the reason why we're here today, it's the thing that all of you should click on to back, because um, you just launched this on Tuesday this week, I believe, and it's Saturday? Yeah. And yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, you know, talk me through how you expand the complexity and expand the options in the yeah. expansion. <laughs> you got me there. All right, I lost all my train of thought. No, um, the the base game has been around for four years. As I mentioned before, people are still finding new strategies and ways to play against each other and counter prop, you know, popular play styles. Yeah. When you really, truly, when you sit across the opponent, since you're throwing away certain cards and hiding other cards, you're hiding information in a way that would give you uh, an advantage. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's kind of crazy about the base game. Now, the um, the expansion uh, really builds on that. And yeah. how it builds on that is through a, different, a couple different facets, which we'll talk through. But the main thing is there are times where you're playing the base game and you're like, it would be really cool if I could do um, this play and, and, and whatnot. The expansion allows you to express yourself a lot better. It allows right. you to... Um, uh, I, I think uh, a good analogy that you're making is that, uh, you know, when there's a new magic set that comes out, it really lets you do more things. And that's exactly what this expansion does, is that it yeah. um, it lets you choose how you want to play. And, you know, I, I, well, I want to just kind of piggyback on that expression in Magic the Gathering comparison. When, for any of you who have played a game like Magic the Gathering or even games like Dota or StarCraft, you're still trying to win. You're still trying to succeed, but the way that Zerg plays out is different than the way that Protoss plays out. Or in a Magic deck, the way that a red-green deck plays out is different than a blue-black uh, deck. Right. They just have an aesthetic difference of how they wind up playing out. And of course, I need to shamelessly scroll past. You can watch me playing <laughs> when the original thing happened. Look at that. You can find me advertising myself on my own stream. I'm just like the Cheesecake Factory. And so, I, love it. Um, I want to talk about some of the mechanics. I want to, I want to start with that expression. Um, yeah. Or excuse me, I want to lead up to that expression part. But in terms of some of the new elements, let me just scroll down. Where is the immortal? Okay, so this is one of the new cards in the expansion. Talk to me about what the immortal does. Yeah, so the immortal is uh, a card that you add to the deck when you're playing two player, um, dealt out. 
and it has the ability to kind of change the entire battlefield. When yeah. you play the Immortal, certain cards get less powerful and other cards get more powerful. And so it's kind oh, of like a, a crazy, it's kind of like a um, change kind of the board state. And if you have the Immortal in your hand, you obviously get to dictate when that happens. Wow. And is there exactly one that's been Correct. one Immortal yes. in the deck? So there's now 19 cards instead of the original 18? Good question. It's actually, so there's uh, two cards that are added. One of them is also called, so the one's the Mortal, and the other is the Warden, which is actually part of the base game, um, but only for three and four player. It's now being brought into the two player. Nice. The Warden is an interesting card too. It allows you to essentially, if there's enough cards in the, the, the court, which is like the middle area that you were yeah, playing, yeah. Um, you're able to switch switch your a card from your hand with the face-up card that both players see. Nice. And Jailbreak so... is what we call it. <laughs> so... <laughs> And so, oh, so we we have the immortal that I, I love that that it sort of swaps some of the values there because I mean the the fun of the game is considering what the possibilities are, and then when this is played, you then have to stop and reconsider the possibilities. Now, Correct. as yeah. as you're playing through this, there's also in the expansion this new notion that is called the army. Walk me through what the army is. Yeah, so the army is two parts. The first part is is that it's a bunch of those cards up there are part of the base game itself. Yeah. But it's one of your it's your own army. Each player has its own army. And when you're playing the game, there are some times where you're just like, man, this strategy would have been perfect if I had uh, an oathbound or if I had a judge, one of those 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 cards that you really want. Yeah. What the army allows you to do is um, you can expend one of your army cards at the beginning of a round to say, hey, I'm gonna swap out this card, showing your opponent what card you're you're getting rid of out of your hand, so that way they still have that uh, imperfect knowledge. Yeah. But then you take secretly from your army a card and put it into your hand. So you can say, I really need that judge. I'm gonna exchange this card for something from my army. Yeah. And what that and what that does also is just makes it so you can again express yourself in a way that you want to proceed with your strategy. Yeah, because I, I remember, it, it, for those of you that just watched us play the Imposter Kings, which, by the way, you can play for free going to theimposterkings.com. When we were playing that game, there's that moment where we, we tuck and hide away a card. It almost feels like the army is a way to, in the middle of a round, tuck away a card and get a card. It's like that same sort of concept where there's just a little bit more ambiguity as to what exactly are the variables that you have and a little bit more choice. I really would have loved to have an army to not immediately die to the assassin last would game. Been, it would have been <laughs> nice to have another response to the assassin, but yeah. however, you're, you're, there's two drawbacks. One is that you're revealing information to your opponent by yeah. doing so, and then the second is uh, once you use an army card, it's gone. Um, so for the entire match that you're playing with your opponent, um, you have to kind of be careful. You can't just keep pulling oh, you know, your favorite nice. cards over and over again. Yeah, 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 because remember, mm. We said a round is like four, five, six minutes. And then you're going to play several rounds to earn points. And whoever gets to seven points at the end of that entire match wins. And so the idea of an army being something you manage over time. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, there, there's there's another caveat to that whole thing, too, which is uh, there's um, this is another player expression piece, which is called signature cards. Yeah. So you get both players get those five base cards. But then there's going to be six unique and powerful cards that you can choose from at the beginning of an entire match. And you say, uh, my play style is very aggressive, so I want to pick up these three cards. It's like, you know, one that allows you to yeah, yeah. Um, pick up your players' discards, etc. So these are just really powerful cards, and you use it to kind of customize how you want to play the game. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, this reminds me... Um... Again, I'm getting a lot of magic vibes. I'm getting a lot of like the idea of like, okay, here's how I like to play sitting on top of a game that I'm trying to win that has a consistent set of rules and a consistent set of tools that are there. But being able mm -hmm. to just go, yeah, you know what? For the next week, I'm just going to be playing with a stranger-focused build and keep the stranger in the army. And again, three out of the six cards means you have to kind of get your load out of your army before every match. That's right. Yeah, and the stranger is a fun one. Everyone loves the stranger. It basically lets you copy the text and name of any card in oh, court. Oh, that's so nasty. That <laughs> means that if you get their assassin out onto court, and then they flip their king, you can use the stranger to assassinate them. It morphs into the the Dude, assassin. Dude, that's so sick. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, as I, in any game where you get to make a copy of a thing that you already have. Hmm. I mean, you're making magic analogies. Obviously, uh, it's been done before. The Simpsons did it. You know, it's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. 
and dude, some of some of the art is just gorgeous. Um, like or some of the art that's being shown here, I mean, it's just incredible. The different it's my favorite of part of, yeah. of of designing. You know, working with Michael and being able to decide, um, you know, how how the cards work and and translating that into yeah. artwork is is, fa is is really fun. And one thing that I want to do is, I told Cena we were going to watch this on air for the first <laughs> time. So this is going to be the very initial chance for all of you. If you wanna, if you wanna watch it, all right, this is it. Get ready. We're about to check it out. That's right, we're gonna to react to this live because React Andy content will soon be 100% of what's made on the internet. <laughs> so here we go, are we gonna hit play? Welcome to the Imposter Kings. Yes! The Imposter Kings is a two to four player game that was successfully funded four years ago through Kickstarter. Introducing the world to the treacherous and high stakes battle for the throne of Nerseti. Many characters help you along the way, yeah. each leveraging their unique talents and abilities. With the throne on the line, every player in the court is looking to make their move. Many players from around the world fight hey, for it's their the right tournament finals. to be a Woo. true king. Very smart. There it is. That's it. Yeti wins a three-point win. Oh, we get the Inception. Boom. Oh, now, that's a so good. new challenge awaits you. In Fragments of Nurseti, you choose what kind of king you want to be. Recruit and craft your army to skillfully outwit your opponents. Play the game your way. Win back the throne. The Imposter Kings, Fragments of Nurseti. Available now on Kickstarter. Yeah, that's what's happening right now. It's available, everybody. Oh, we're just gonna listen to that listen to that guitar solo. Yes! Oh my god! Cena fuck yeah! Oh keep keep playing it. Is this on Spotify? Where's the album? How much do I need to pay to get that on my Kickstarter rewards, man? Oh yeah, he's absolutely shredding at the end of that. That's, hell yeah! 90s 90s uh commercial certified. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Find it on Bandcamp. I, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I want to take a chance to look at some of, let's see here, uh, some of the footage of some of these in play. So this is the immortal that's going to change some of the numbers and let me rearrange my, my face in the OBS windows. So that way I can get out of the way of the hand. And I really liked in that, um, that little trailer showing what the cards look like. And like the play map, the beautiful art that you saw there, the art that you see here, these are part of the Kickstarter rewards, which again, all of you should aspire to go to the highest tier. Seen as far <laughs> too humble and modest to plug the amazing quality of what he's created. And that's why I'm here. And we'll get to that in a moment. But this is what the game actually looks like at the start. So you'll see here is, oops, I want to rewind a little bit. So you'll see that everything's been dealt out. Uh, the opponent has been uh, dealt a card of hands. Cena has been dealt a card of hands. Here's the revealed card that no one has. Here is the unrevealed card that no one has. That is the spice that's going to factor into everything. We even got the card cam down here. Um, so it's going to be this starting period at the game where you're going to decide what it is that you want to be chucking away. You know, since there's a lot of people here who have not played or seen this game, we're just going to ignore what any of the strategic implications of this are. I'm going to pull this down just a smidge. You can tell that I'm not great because I'm arranging my hands, and that's a huge tell. So never, when you play with me in person, you know, if I pull from the right hand, <laughs> you know what my highest card is. <laughs> <laughs> Noticing that, you know, always check your replays, folks. Oh, yeah, that's right. You got you to find your own tell. So we can yeah. see that um, this is the start of a round. And I mean, you can even just yeah. see in the YouTube video this, or maybe you can't because Cena's covering this. This entire video is four and a half minutes. So the first 30 to 60 seconds, just trying to decide what card you want to discard so you don't have it anymore. What card you want to tuck and hide away. Cena's now put something away. So this is, this is just a normal start okay. of the game. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting out with a five. There's going to be some declarations. And the Immortal is going to be coming up in here, which changes and tunes 
the values of other cards that are in play. Right. So right there, I guessed correctly with my uh, my judge, which means that I can play my Inquisitor next turn. Yeah. He then calls the soldier. He misses on my hand. He was trying to see whether I had, I think, uh, King's Hand or something. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was, but now I'm going to be using, since uh, I have something in my antechamber, I play it. I get to guess a card in his hand. If I guess correctly, then he has to play that card. So I think I call a king's hand here. He's forced to play it. This right. seems familiar, right? Yep. <laughs> so yeah. So you play. I you... have the assassin in my hands, which is why I'm pulling out his king's yeah, hand. Yeah, you can see it just right down there. Same play as before. So you've played the inquisitor, which effectively forces the king's hand out in some capacity. So there's the king's hand. So That's you know, right. Cena has the the queen in hand. Uh, actually, two queens in hand. So could play one of those drawn straight from the right side. Okay, so I play the queen here, and the queen reads, disgrace every card before her. So that just basically, none of those cards are available to be played anymore. And I do that because he might have a fool. I find out later on that that's the face down card. Yeah. But I do this because the fool lets you pick up any card from court. And by playing the queen here, I'm now effectively starting the game over and saying, um, let's get rid of that, that possibility for you. Right, right. Yeah, because again, I want to stress all the cards that are played face up both represent the goal of trying to play the last card and sort of the status of things, but they can also be used as resources with other Correct. cards. Uh, and of course, with the addition of the army and the signature mm -hmm. cards, I assume, I mean, no need to spoil all of it, but like, I assume that there are cards that are signature cards that have other interesting forms of interaction with the court in this way that maybe if I love working with the cards that are played, that I might be able to factor in. Right, absolutely. So after this queen, he has to either flip his king, which is dire for him because I have the assassin. Yeah. Or if he has an elder, he can play an elder. And I believe he does have an elder in this one. So we'll see what happens. Okay. All right. So so right now, all all else being equal, you win the game if there Correct. is nothing else here. So there, there's the queen Correct. being played. That's it. Done. If, he, if you want to pause for just a second there, I was just going to say, if he did not have an elder um in that in his hand in this case uh or there's another cult called an oathbound that allows you to kind of play over uh, a high value card uh he would have lost the game because he would have been forced to flip his king and i have that assassin nice so he has the elder that bails him out um and so i'm going to continue to try to put pressure on him not knowing that he has the immortal so we'll see what happens all right so right now it's just kind of been a vanilla base game of imposter games. correct yeah so, so i'm thinking for a little bit this is kind of the pivotal point this usually happens in the game where there's like one pivotal point you know magic arena that little rope shows up and shows you have a little bit of time left this is it right here <laughs> this is that's when i'm so so you've played out a soldier and what's happening right correct now? so now i'm guessing um do you have uh i know what cards he might have in his hand so i i guess correctly there and i'm disgracing more cards again fearful of that fool i'm just yeah. continuously getting rid of cards that soldier becomes a seven when i guess correctly so he's forced to play a high value eight All right. um he's now trying to force me to flip my king or play my princess which is my nine i yeah. want to save my nine i want to save it until he's on the ropes um so i'm gonna yeah. flip my king here Put, I get my successor. I flip that over. He now has an empty board to play on. And this is, I believe, when the Immortal comes out. Um, again, okay. new to the game. Yeah. Forgot about this. So, Immortal comes out, and I'm like, oh, shoot. Uh, I still have yeah. royalty in my hand, and the Immortal is very good against royalty. <laughs> so, what, so this, is, this is an interesting collection of things. So, first of all, the Immortal is a six. Relatively right. high-value card. There's not a lot of cards that are six or higher in the combined deck of 20. Steadfast cannot be muted or have its value lowered by other cards. Muting is effectively, its ability doesn't do anything. Correct. So, um, so this is just a six that is fixed. It is this way. It is now this new dimension that will passively affect everything now and forever. That says, well, this is important. Other than it, yeah. it, it's, uh, it, can't, it can't have its value lowered by other cards. You'll actually see this one will lower its value. Um, and there's a reason for that, which ah, we can talk about see. later. All yeah. right. So while this card is in court, this card and the Warlord gain royalty. All other royalty and elders lose one value and are muted. This card has a value of five in court. So um, I assume then, 
understanding some of just the numbers. And actually, this, this is a good opportunity to zoom in hard and just show how one card does a lot in this game and there's a lot to consider. Because, I mean, yeah, yes, the Immortal changes a lot, but, like, every card in Imposter Kings changes a lot. That's, like, the entire design of the game. But if someone has a six out, you'd play the Immortal as a six, and then it would be a five in court. So it's kind of, like, Rex. slightly mm -hmm. reducing. But everyone else in the future is also slightly reduced. And it's also so this royalty is... now. Interesting. Yeah. This is a, a lot of people affectionately call this a coup. And what happens when you coup the core with the immortal, um, that means yeah. that all the royalty become really weak and the warlord becomes the best card in the game all of a sudden. Ah, as long nice. as this card, as long as this card doesn't get disgraced. Now there has to be some counterplay to this, right? And right. Uh, if you actually, the soldier that's actually right underneath that, yeah. it has a value of five. The soldiers can escort the immortals out. They can rally themselves and fight against the Aku, if you will. Yeah. And so um, playing the soldier, the soldier, if you guess what's in their hand correctly, you can disgrace cards. And that naturally lends you to be able to get rid of the immortal. So, and so, of course, disgracing, flipping it over, turning it into effectively junk. So now, exactly. now you're in a pickle. You're reading this card. You're like, what, what does this card do? Why did I design this card? You're... <laughs> It's like, what, am I, what nice. was I thinking? I did this to myself. Like, I'm, this must be a tough moment being a designer today. Yeah, I should just say maybe the, I was the other player, obviously. Um, no, you can tell it's me. <laughs> I'm wearing, you know. But yeah, so now I'm playing a seven and I'm thinking to myself, I'm in a big pickle here because if he has the Warlord, I'm dead to rights. I don't have anything that can really get me over this. Yeah. Um. So he's now considering... Uh, okay, he plays a Warden. He's pressuring me now. He knows I have to now play something that is higher than a 7. And yeah. if I play my Princess, it's not going to be good. And when you say pressuring, just to be clear, we're, right now it's all about the numbers. The Warlord was played, it's a 5. A 7 was played. So it has to now be a 7 or higher. So another 7 was played. The pressure is there's just, there's just not that many more pricier cards. It's not pricier, excuse me. Uh, higher value cards and the only one that you can see off in the corner is this okay. nine cost princess right and i have that six that i was talking about the oath bound and it allows you to play over a higher value card um and uh it'll come up later actually but the point is is that you can play on a higher but it comes with the cost of playing another Ooh. card as well yeah so now i'm playing the princess it only has a value of eight because of the immortal, so he can now play this warlord which uh if you want to pause for a second i can just explain yeah. the immortal says the warlord becomes a nine. Uh, becomes royalty, and the warlord reads: if there's royalty in the court, it becomes a nine. So now it is effectively, it is effectively the leader of. of it this made kingdom. itself a nine. Like there's the it synergy made itself a between nine. the cards. Correct. So and, and if you look the the cards themselves, they look very similar. It's because they're from the same nation. But the warlord is the leader, and so when you have the immortal out, you play the warlord. Bam! You're now the the highest value card in in the entire in the entire set. And so now. You can't. So now play. I have to do that. I can't play. It's a bummer because he's so close to running out of cards. I have to play my Oathbound, which lets you play it, but at the cost of playing another card. I'm now out of cards. He can safely flip his king, and I have no cards left, so he wins, and he's now gloating um, and excitedly yeah. showing me that he <laughs> he's, he's pretty excited that he, he got that play to work because, again, if I couldn't... Uh, I, I had to essentially throw away my Assassin, and then he yeah. was able to flip for free, so... And, and, and again, I want to stress that one of the things that we've just done is we spent a few minutes going through this four and a half minute video. When you actually play the game, it's there, it, there's some fast turns. And then like Cena said, there's like one or two moments where you're going, ah, this, this, I'm going to make one decision, but I need to consider a lot. How do I plan around it? And whether you're right or whether you're wrong, it's first to seven points. So you might have a one point win and then a two point win and then a one point win. And now you're tied two and two and you're working through. So again, it's this very sort of like, you know, this is why I like comparing it to like a combo in a fighting game where you like do a sequence and you get a chunk of damage in. So let's... that's exactly right. Like at that pause point, that's usually when most of the, the decision has been set. And now yeah. you're just letting, you're making the final tweak to, to yeah. see what happens. So here we actually um, see how the deal works. You see the Kings being set out. Everything's been dealt. Here's the last two cards in the deck that are set off to the side. This card, again, that was flipped is no longer part of the equation. 
neither player will ever get to access this, and no one knows what this is, and they'll also never get to access this. Oathbound, as Cena was saying, this card, it's like Counterspell. And so it creates a lot of disruption. Now, this, this is, again, the spice of the game or in what these two cards are. Because one of them is what you're worried about, and the other one is what you're not worried about. And so now you, and you're not worried about the Oathbound. You can make a plan around it. Uh, the the last game, I was really worried about the Fool, and it happened to be the Face Down card. So I yeah, really hedged yeah. my bet on something that didn't really pan out. Um, that's called the that's the King's Guard, and uh, the Oathbound was the thing that I was able to play over um, on that last hand. Yeah. But the thing that's interesting here is that um, we're going to be showcasing one of the new kings here, um, which I'm not sure if I've ever revealed information about this. So this is exclusive. Oh um, my gosh! A world premiere here on Day Nine TV. I'm looking at my hand and I'm evaluating. There's a lot of different ways I can play this hand, but I notice that I have an assassin. I know the king's hand is out of the game and I have two royalties. So I'm thinking to myself, I can pressure him pretty hard here. If I play some high value cards, he's gonna have to flip his king. So I decide that he goes first here. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pick up the master tactician. Um, and so- And let me just take a moment yeah. to pause here. So we've talked a little bit about armies, uh, the Immortal being a new card. We've talked about these signature cards. Where does the Master Tactician live in this? Is this the facet Wonderful. of the king? Correct, yeah. So there are actually the kings in that video, they split from the from the main king. But yeah. this is uh, the main point of the, uh, the facets is it helps you play a specific play style that you might want to for a game. The base king by itself, really powerful. Now there's two flavors of the facets. One of them allows you to reveal more information to your opponent with the option to be able to go to your army mid game. The other one, the one that I'm going to showcase here is called the master tactician, a very high risk, high reward. Oh um, yeah, my king. favorite. And this is, this, is, this is one example where it pays off. Um, the, the master tactician allows you to essentially put down two successors rather than one. However, the ah. cost of it is that you lose one of those cards Unless you can do something special, which well, I'll explain when we get there. All right. So, you know, I, yeah. I, and I want to just point out for any of you, um, when we get back to the Kickstarter, we'll see this. The $50 tier is the base game plus the expansion. Get the base game, play it some, and then introduce these kinds of mechanics in because they're just a little bit more complexity added on top. And the complexity is the kind that you would find yourself wanting in the base game. <laughs> right like like god i wish and, i could have gotten a way to deal with the assassin we even say uh in the in the expansion it's modular you just keep adding more and more things until you get to the whole thing first add the immortal just adding the immortal itself adds so much to the game and then add the armies you know like so you can actually yeah. go piecemeal up but here's the master tactician yeah so it says um, after placing your successor which is you know one of the hidden cards Place another hand face down next to it as, as, as its squire. Great. So now I have two face down cards next to my king. And then you can... Uh, so flipping the king, which is the move that you kind of are always trying to corner your opponent into in the game. Flipping the king to disgrace the card on the throne. If this disgrace card has the same base value as your successor, you may reveal and take your successor. Then either take your squire into your hand or reveal and remove your squire to rally one. And so uh, rally one means, is this the mechanic of go to your army and get one of them? That's hey, yeah. the Figured naming conventions, they make so much a sense. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted to just, uh, for this, I know that you have that naming thing where you're like, when something's like frosted, it should actually freeze things. I like, yeah. oh, just rally, rally hopefully makes sense, you know? Yeah, so. no, because if this was like, interrogate one and it's like well interrogate <laughs> means you actually get to get a card from your army but yeah so so normally you flip your king and you just get the card this is a conditional flip to get the card so like if i tucked away a six and at no point did a six really show up here i would never get to flip and get that one card so am i understanding the risk reward correctly uh, well, you would be able to flip, but the thing is, is that you would have to take one of your two successors rather than being able to take both. If you're able to hit on the same value that's not being played, and there's a way, there's ways that you can do that, which I think this this clip showcases. But the main point of this is, yeah. when you play the master tactician, it's risky. If you don't flip correctly, you lose a card, and that's really bad in a game where you have to be the last card being played on the throne. So that's nice. that's not great. 
Um, so I decide I'm going to go Master Tactician. Here's what my play was, my thinking. Yeah. He's going to try to inquisit something out of my hand. So what I'm going to do is use the Master Tactician to hide two of my highest value cards in my hand. Oops, sorry. Like so. Yep. So that was the, the Warlord that I put down as my successor. And then I squiring one of my high... I'm debating whether I should hide my, my, my Assassin there. That's what that is right there. Yeah. But I, then I decide to put my Princess down instead. So now these are my two cards that I'm hiding. And I'm hoping that when he hits that Inquisitor, he's going to ask for one of those cards and he's going to miss. And then if he misses on that Inquisitor, I can counter with my own play. All right, let's watch it happen. So there's, there's so he, Inquisitor. He says Princess, which is one of my one of my hidden cards. Yeah. I'm giggling. Um, I do not have a and, princess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now I can inquisit back, and I'm going to pull a card that is a seven. And if you want to pause, there's two parts of reasons why this is good. Well, right. I'm laughing because I'm telling me exactly what's about to happen. Yeah. I'm pulling a seven from his hand. Yeah, because you've hidden Go a ahead, seven, which means that you get to flip your king. Exactly. Get both this, because the value matches, and yeah. the second one is the bonus. Correct. Got and it. not only that, but I'm pulling the seven that allows him to get the king's hand back into his hand to prevent Ooh. my assassination. So by doing this, so now I call it out, he has to play it. Now he can't use its ability because it requires four face-up cards in court. There's only three. So now I'm flipping my king, I'm showing him that I have the warlord, and then I take both into my hand. Nice. So I've done like five things there with one play, and it worked out in my favor this time. Plenty of times it blows up in your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, uh, you, know, um, you know, kind of connecting back to the core of the game, the winner of the round is whoever plays the last, or if you are unable to play a card, you lose. Correct. And so when you hide two cards, they're protected from being discarded, forced to be played, disrupted. They're protected temporarily, but you're down two cards. So if you mess up and can't get the, like those cards back, you've basically just increased the probability that you will run out of cards sooner. You have one less card than your opponent. Oh, this is so good. Exactly. And, and going back to that point that we were making, when you sit down and play across from someone, I know that he, he knows that I like the princess. So he tried to get my princess out of my hand. If he had called the queen or anything else, because yeah. he knew that I like those, that would have changed the game dramatically. I think I would have been a, a pickle, as they would have said. He would oh, be yeah. able to pick up the king's hand. And so that's why that's that, that's that high risk and reward. Um, the rest of the clip is just us playing, but I do eventually get to assassinate him. So he's yeah. playing out as immortal. Um, I have the warlord in my hand. It's... Uh, <laughs> I then laugh at him for trying to play the immortal. I was like, that's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you just saw that I had a warlord. Um, but the rest of this clip is just us playing, and I believe it ends up with me assassinating him. So yeah. being able to execute on that plan. Yeah, and I mean, I like your point about it depends on the player. Because there's a kind of player that, for instance, will always hide the assassin. So you start to realize, oh, if I have a chance to ask questions about your hand, I'm almost certain you're always hiding the assassin. So I'm just going to start asking for other questions. And then if you see that your opponent never asks you about the assassin, you're going to start keeping the assassin in hand. You know, yeah. and so like literally just that is like a one card equilibrium that depends upon the opponent. Um, right. So, yeah, um, this is this is showcasing again the, the risk reward and it really worked out for me here. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of counterplay between that, but I think that's exactly what you're talking about, which is um you can start sneaking things in um that's the reason why there's a set um because as you're playing with someone they might try to you know sneak a couple things in like the assassin yeah. so and so so here i am just trying to squeeze yeah. him out <laughs> just trying to squeeze him out <laughs> playing the princess slamming down the nine great for brandon yeah, yeah. and then and then i'm hearing oh <laughs> all right is it, is it going to be flipping are we flipping it I, what's going to happen i think he's starting to realize what's going on so he's going to just try to make sure he doesn't flip I have enough card support in my hand to be able to fix this, though. Yeah, no, and it's kind of one of these funny things that, you know, uh, it almost reminds me a little bit of the feeling of playing poker. Like, losing mm. a round is like, all right, you you got me, I, I fold. All right, but, all right, look, we got a new hand. We're going to deal a new hand, and we're going to try again. Like, the, the rounds happen pretty quick when you're actually doing it in person, and I can imagine it's even faster in the online client when you get used to it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I think... Um, it's, it's really just, uh, princess got me. <laughs> <laughs> so now he realizes that I had both royalty in hand and he's, uh, uh, bedazzled, let's say.
Oh, I love I love that. He's absolutely snazz dazzled by your great plays. That just absolutely. <laughs> so I so. want I want to just point out some of the um, rewards that are here. Obviously, this is a Kickstarter for the expansion. So the most basic thing you can do is twenty five bucks to just get the expansion to the Imposter Kings. I'm going to tuck myself over here now that I'm not blocking the hand. Um, and hey, I want to play right now. You can get the beta access. Uh, but let me just say, I'm going to skip past all that and suggest that many of you consider this $50 tier, which gives you the base game and the expansion. Now, you have heard me say a lot that I'm a huge fan of things like demos, letting people see the game from, I don't know, a streamer like your pal Day9. And I want to <laughs> remind all of you that you can go to the imposterkings.com. You can click on play here, and there's multiple ways to play the game for free to check it out if you would like. You can also just take my word for it and buy the $50 tier right away. But there's some <laughs> some fun, uh, exciting things deeper in the Kickstarter rewards, because I see the deluxe edition. Cena, I know yes. you may know a thing or two about this Kickstarter. What are some of these higher tier rewards? Uh, yes, I unfortunately had to write uh, all of it. So <laughs> if you go to the actual, well, the you reward, didn't have the fleet of five hundred developers and marketing team did this. My goodness. Yeah, me, just me and Chat GP. I'm just kidding. I never use that. <laughs> 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 so if you go to the, go to the rewards <clears throat> tab at the top, I think it'll showcase the sure. um, the individual things that you can see for each of those different tiers. There's optional add-ons. So if you scroll down just a bit, the add-ons there. Um, there yep. is uh, additional expansion copies. Um, there are limited time playmats and an unlimited version of the playmat. So there's the Caves of Solaris. That's the first playmat that you saw there yep. with the, the background. Right. Um, you here. can also buy. Yep, yeah, exactly. And there's two versions of all playmats. There's the unlimited version, which has the broken crown. Anyone can get that. And then for people who win tournaments and such, there's limited edition versions of it. But there's one also for the Kickstarter right there, which is that limited edition yeah. uh, playmat. Um, there's also whoa. card artwork. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yeah, my yeah. god! Yeah. There's the card a art card whoa. artwork. Any any of the artwork that you may have seen in the game, you can actually choose. Um, you can get about five. I, I think I limited because I'm hand making uh, all the cropping for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pressing it myself. No, I'm kidding. I I, I but it is really nice. Um, I actually, you know, I have one right here. Let me see if I can grab it real fast. Get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. All right. Oh, pretty cool. Oh, that's get beautiful. Um, you know, a print that you can put in any frame you want. I got the true king. Actually, this was one of our tournaments. This was the prize for uh, the people who played. The, uh, the, everyone got the imposter kings, and then the person who won got the true king with the eyes. Woo. All right. Heck yeah. So there's that. Um, there's also, uh, as you mentioned, there's a, a early beta Discord um, for playing on the tabletop simulator. When you get to the deluxe edition, which is what you were just on on the seventy-five dollars, that yeah. one is um, that one has the other playmat, which the is the seals of Nerseti. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll be right back. I'm gonna grab that too. Oh, he's gone. But part of me was was gonna be like, it seems as like, oh, and I gotta be right back. There's someone at the door, and he's just gone. <laughs> I really like uh, the playmats quite a lot, so that's why I, yeah. I made an effort there. Um, so this is. The Fields of Nerseti playmat, um, it's really nice. Uh, really like playing on the playmat for all of my games. Uh, yeah. So so that's what the Deluxe Edition gets you. There's also a Deluxe Edition for getting started. So if you like what you see, uh, then this is the base game, the expansion, and this awesome playmat. Um, the later, I think this is the first time you're seeing this, so I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I'm to, ready. I'm, I'm getting a live reaction from you here. All right. Okay. Um, party. Seattle-based right. oh. launch party. So if you're oh, in the area... <laughs> no way, dude. Seattle-based launch party. Oh, my. It's time to get on an airplane. I'm coming up to yeah. this. <laughs> so this is, uh, if you're in the area or if you can find your way over here, um, we want to do a launch party. Last time we did the Kickstarter, it was right when COVID started. So yeah, not great. Um, so people who did that last time i reached out to all the backers and i said hey um we're not able to do the party for safety reasons uh, but all of them said they want to support the game extra for them they get to uh there's like an exclusive drink they'll get or something for for appreciation oh, but yes. the point is is that you can still be the part of the party the, the spring water is... of nerseti <laughs> oh yes that's what we call it 
This is uh, the immortalized here. So this yeah. is thank you so much for supporting us. We will put you in the manual and say, or a name of your choice in the, the manual. You want to be immortalized. You're now in the thing. Also yeah. gets you uh, a limited foil print. So we're going to be experimenting with foil prints of cards. And this is the only way you can get ever get the uh, immortal foil print. So, um, you know, there's only a limited quantity of this one that uh, once we make it, it's going to be gone, um, but uh, it's a way to kind of show our thanks for supporting us. Um, there is one last one, which is or one last real one. This is called the True King Edition. Yeah. This has everything, um, as well as a, a a True King token. And I'm dep Ooh. depending, like you know, I'm 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 surveying people who have gotten this tier. What what the physical representation is, but the essential point of it is, is that at any time you find me at a tournament, you find me in person, you find me online, you say, hey. I really like that thing that you made like a week ago. I would love if you could do me a favor and do this. I would love for you to sign this. I'd love for you to, you know, it's just kind of like, a, hey, I supported you um, at this tier, like, and yeah. uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this token, and uh, we'll see what we can do to try to make uh, make your life, you know, happy. If you're like, oh, you know what, I want a wallet that has the the assassin peeking out of it. Uh, you know, I'll design that for you and make it. And so that's what the True King token is, is more of like a, awesome. oh my a, a special God. thanks token. That's insane. Oh, yeah. So like if you're just someone like, again, I'm imagining the Kickstarter is going to be live for uh, I think it's 38 more days, 25 more days. 25, yeah. I don't know where I got 38 from. Um, <laughs> it's 142, oh, 25 days. So for instance, if you spend the next three weeks playing this game and you're really enjoying it, um, and you want to get something special? Oh my gosh! You could you could get this true king token and be like Cena. I literally want a magic card with imposter king art in there and like a custom design for a card. Sure, That's yeah, the sort I of think, thing. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, this is the the riskiest Kickstarter reward because obviously I can't do everything that you're asking for. But the yeah. idea behind this is that I would work with you to try to find something that makes it special for you. Yeah. Um, a couple ideas is making uh, one of the community members, for example, for his brother, wanted to have a T-shirt with his favorite, yeah. you know, creation there. And so I, I made that T-shirt and sent it for them for Christmas. Um, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that I would love to help out with. And then this is the Sean, uh, the Sean Day Nine uh, tier. Uh, oh so boy. You can, you can do it oh, on, on stream if you want. <laughs> you oh, yeah, no. I, I like enter my credit card information on air. <laughs> Turns out it was a lot more than $5,000 to make that happen. <laughs> this was this is more of a, a, a joke here. It even starts with a disclaimer of if you're ever considering this, like, uh, message us. But the idea here is that if anyone wants to actually go all in, like, you find yourself in love with this game, you want it to be successful, you're like one of those people who still likes Artifact. Then this is the tier. <laughs> a long hauler, a true long hauler. <laughs> true long hauler. Um, this is something that I would talk with you about and try to find a way to make it like you know more than just the true king, but something where we can design something together and build something together. So this is this is kind of like the uh, please don't do this. Uh, and but if you do want to really support the game, let me know and we can we can work something out. So that's wonderful. And like again, I just want to give a shout out to. Uh, Cena's excellence with design and running and managing the community and just the, again, I think that there is there is an indescribable amount of credibility around play the game for free. It's so fun that you can play for free, meet people on the Discord, and then if you're enjoying it enough, you can buy. This is the kind of stuff that like I think is why you've had four years of like a rich community continuing to play this game for so long. Seen as the I, goat, man. Go I have ahead. to talk about the community really fast. Oh, also, yeah. um, so the first thing is the community is absolutely fantastic. They're Everyone amazing. who plays the game, just play it. And a lot of it actually came from your initial your initial stream. Like a yeah. lot, as I mentioned, Goose, Coco. Um, there's a plenty of people who I'm missing as well, but like they're just fantastic people who are playing the highest level of this game, but not like pushing their glasses up, like I'm gonna like absolutely make sure that i destroy you and then like leave and get my prize money type of like community more so of like a um let's figure out new things together let's play puzzles together let's and so i, I can't thank the community enough um and for those of you who are not part of the community yet um please don't feel free to, to join the discord don't be shy um yeah. everyone will play with Boy. you um and we'll try to teach you the ins and outs of the game so 
I would say go into the Discord channel. Um, say you want to play a couple games. Uh, there will be people out there who want to play it. And as we're getting more and more ramped up for the expansion, there's probably going to be more community tournaments as well. Um, the one other thing I was going to mention is on that Kickstarter, there is also if you want that foil, but it's uh, it's you know, it's, it's not uh, you know, you don't know. you don't have to you don't have to bring up the referral program where. I don't know, as someone who might selfishly be trying to on, refer dude. five people himself. <laughs> you've, already, you've already done the, the 5K here, I thought. No. Um, so, so yeah, there is a referral program. And ever since I put this out, I've been getting really funny group messages from people being like, hey, there's this really cool unrelated thing that I love called the Imposter Kings, you know, but say I sent you. Um, and the reason is because if you refer up to five people to pledge on the Kickstarter um, after they put in their pledge, um, you uh, also will get this uh, incredibly rare foil uh, immortal card as part of that. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. And the first question I got after I said that to some of my uh, my you know loyal followers was, "Can I get two if I do the referral?" And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, but also thank you. Uh, that's the, I, the more important thing for me is just uh, it's uh, for me the thing that's most important is that we have build on that community of really cool people and play um, having people play the game and, and really enjoy it. Cause I think there's a lot of depth to still be explored here. And I, I literally cannot wait to start playing online. Um, I mean, cause again, the base game is implemented online and my understanding is, Hey, one of those stretch goals is that if you get down here, I think it was the 12,000. Yeah. Want to expand that web client. And I mean, oh, yeah. already since we have begun chatting about this on stream, I mean, it's we're, we're already at 6,000 out of 10K. And I mean, it's kind of one of these things where I feel like there's literally no way you're not going to get to the 12K amount. Uh, I hope so. I mean, true I, kings I, in chat, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, true kings. Um, but yes, no, uh, this was implemented by um, Vlad. He's, uh, if you go to the team section, really awesome uh, developer, uh, and he's been really killing it when it comes to the development we have like a section of like, like bugs and stuff like that there's like two bugs yeah. because he's like very very thorough about it and then <laughs> and then as soon as they come up he's like i pushed out a new patch also i added like five more things i'm like oh my gosh like you know so, <laughs> yeah. so i'd really love to get him um oh that's so sweet i didn't even realize this his favorite games he put uh oh. imposter king's original <laughs> you know i guess that <laughs> makes so sense sweet. given that he's building the web client yeah <laughs> Well, he didn't. So he actually he never played Imposter Kings. Uh, I, he was referred from someone within the community. They were like, "Hey, I know this guy. He sick. builds games." And then I told him, "He's like, it's a very interesting problem." That's what he told me. And then like a week later, he's like, "Oh my god, here's like he's implemented all the rules." And he he's done a really good job of making sure like that tracker that you were showing where it like shows you what your opponent can have. Yeah. Very thoughtful game design um, when it comes to programming it. So. Uh, cannot shout him enough. Of course, uh, Mike as well. Uh, above him is the artist. Um, as many people have already oh, yeah. mentioned, the artwork is fantastic. Um, check him out as well. So, hell yeah. But yeah. Anyways, I just you know I'm I'm overwhelmed with uh, with gratitude for for all the kind words that you've said and for the whole community yeah. for kind of coming out and and uh, really showing that there there is um, you know interest in this type of thing. I'd really love to continue developing it. So. Dude, hell yes, Cena. Thank you for coming on and like doing this because I'll be honest, I kind of, I, I, I actually kind of pestered Cena to do this because I have a lot of buddies that do various game development or board game prototyping or frankly just make stuff that's like a game they just want to play between friends. And I think that like what Cena's done with the Imposter Kings is amazing, not just in terms of the design, but like the implementation of the art and the aesthetic and the flavor text and just the way that the you know the sort of narrative layer works with the design layer i just think it's done brilliantly so i was like cena cena when's your kickstarter get on my stream <laughs> cena uh so thank you for coming on because i found this to be a ton of fun and once again everyone imposter kings is the name of the game expansion is fragments of nerseti it'll be up for a month go to imposterkings.com to check out the game for free to learn more where to buy, to watch great narration from our pal Shane in the How the Game Works video. And uh, Sina, thank you so much for joining. A any other last words before I just end this stream? <laughs> just hit the red button. No. Yeah. Uh, 
I again, I just cannot thank well you. The pestering is really helpful, and I really appreciate that. The <laughs> community, everyone who's joined, everyone who's new and old, um, thank you so much for your support, um, and for you know everyone who's really worked on the game and has helped it out. I even saw Papy uh, Papyrus in the in the um, or Platypus in the chat. He actually implemented the first tabletop simulator version of the oh, game. Awesome. So, so, I mean, just honestly, I, I can't thank everyone enough, and I really hope to see you all there. We have content on our YouTube video. We have content in our Discord. Come check us out. We'd love to have you join. Thanks, Cena. Thanks, everyone, for <laughs> watching. Thanks. Bye. Thank you bye, so bye, much. Bye, bye, bye. Goodbye. All right. <laughs> goodbye.